Thank you. Um, so the first speaker for this afternoon's session is uh, Marissa Takahashi, who comes to us from the Kiyotis Digital Observatory. Um, today they'll be speaking about building an ethical data infrastructure. Uh, please welcome them. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, cool. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. My name is Marisa Takahashi. I manage the Digital Observatory. So it's a research infrastructure at the Institute for Future Environments, which we call IFE, at the Queensland University of Technology. So this is my first Linux conference. So it's been great so far. Uh, thanks to my colleague, Betsy Alpert, for recommending the conference. So in this presentation, I will discuss the challenges of building a trusted and ethical research data infrastructure. I will also describe the key principles and the benefit of the infrastructure approach in the development of the digital observatory. So, but first, I would like to acknowledge the Ugambi people, the First Nations owner of the land where we now stand. I pay respect to their elders past and present and leaders emerging. I pay res my respect to their customs and creation spirits. Okay, so <clears throat> the ongoing digital transformation has resulted in massive amount of digital data that can be collected for various purposes in both industry and academia. With 17 billion connected devices and 4.3 billion active internet users, the entire digital universe is expected to reach 44 zettabytes by 2020. That's this year. As a society, we have been seduced by the promise of an interconnected world that will allow for more time for creative and collaborative endeavors. We all share the hope that these digital platforms will form the foundation for a global interconnected communities all harmoniously working together for the social good and a better world. But as you know, reality is vastly different. The Utopian Network for the Social Good has devolved into fragmented silos pursuing narrow agenda. The data we are sharing on these platforms are being harvested, analyzed, and monetized. Moreover, the increasing size and complexity of data sets and the growing sophistication of analytical methods raise ethical questions, especially as research agenda and industrial applications move beyond computational and natural sciences to the more sensitive social aspects of human lives, such as behavior, health, and politics. So undoubtedly, data has become a new class of economic asset. More data equals more power. And unfortunately, that power is concentrated on a few big players. The Facebook Cambridge Analytica debacle and the increasing number of data breaches and data misuses highlighted the sensitive nature of this platform's data and how this data can be used in unscrupulous ways. What is ignored is the fact that behind those data are actually humans who are mostly unaware that their data are being used in ways that they did not intend. It has become urgent to strike a balance between the benefits of big data research and development and the ethical implications <clears throat> on human subjects who generate those digital data. So there is a problem of trust between the digital platforms and their users, whose data are being har harvested and sold without their knowledge and informed consent. This is exacerbated by information asymmetry and power imbalance. There is widespread misunderstanding of privacy and also a widespread violations of privacy. 
protecting privacy has become complex and expensive. There is lack of transparency about how the digital platforms operate and the algorithms they use, the data and the data they share. These digital powerhouses have been claiming that self-regulation is the best way forward. But is it really? Insufficient information security and increasing sophistication of hackers have resulted in increasing security breaches worldwide. In the context of research, there has been short-term solutions and lots of duplications of efforts across multiple faculties, universities, and institutions, primarily due to lack of communication and collaboration. With the Cambridge Analytica case, there has been a big hit on research credibility. Facebook has blamed the academic for sharing the Facebook data he collected with Cambridge Analytica. However, the academic in question has actually countersued Facebook, claiming that Facebook has given him permission to use the data for academic as well as commercial purposes. So we might think that these trust and ethical problems are new and associated with the digital revolution and the advent of big data. But actually, it is not. What is happening today sounds very familiar to what has happened de decades ago in a very different domain of cell research and the advent of bi biotechnology. So who among you here has heard the name Henrietta Lacks? Have the question? Okay. So for those who have, please bear with me while I share her interesting story. So Henrietta Lacks was a poor African-American tobacco, tobacco farmer who in 1951 underwent treatment for cervical cancer. A sample of her tumor cells were taken for biopsy and was shared with a medical researcher. For years, medical researchers had been trying to grow cells in the laboratory outside of the human body, but with no success. Once removed from the human body, most cells die immediately or shortly after. It was by sheer chance that it was discovered that Henrietta's cancer cells can reproduce reliably and indefinitely, creating a pure perpetual cell line. So the HeLa cell, the HeLa cell line, as it became known, was shared and distributed widely among medical researchers and has made significant impact on medical research and development of vaccine and cancer treatments. The HeLa cell line has produced huge benefits for the common good. The reason why HeLa cell lines are critical to many medical breakthroughs is because it enabled researchers to do various experiments on these cells in ways that would not have been possible to do on living human beings. Moreover, these experiments can be repeated, replicated, and verified because of the abundant supply of the HeLa cells. So HeLa cells has enabled significant research achievements. It was instrumental to the discovery of polyvaccine by Jonas Sag in 1953, as well as the discovery of cervical cancer vaccine by Ian Fraser and Xiao Yi Su in 2006 at the University of Queensland. HeLa cells were the first cells that were launched in space in ongoing effort to understand the effect of zero gravity and space travel on cells. HeLa cells enabled medical research break and breakthroughs that have launched many medical researchers' careers and spawned Nobel Prize winners and fueled the growth of multi-billion dollar biotech industry. But Henrietta Lacks' case is a story of grave injustice and ethical dilemmas. Henrietta Lacks and her family were never told of the collection and use of her cell samples for research. She died several months after her cancer diagnosis and radiation treatment. 
There was never any consent given by Henrietta Lacks nor her family about the collection and use of her cell samples for research nor for its commercial exploitation. It would be 20 years after Henrietta's death that her family found out by accident about the existence of the Hello cell lines and its use for research. In the 1950s, many doctors and medical researchers often used patients from public hospitals for research without their knowledge. Many scientists believe that since patients were being treated for free in the public wards, that it was fair for them to use, it was fair to use them for research subject as a form of payment. The public hospital where Henrietta Lacks was treated was one of the hospi few hospitals which offered free hospital service for African American people in the 1950s when racial segregation was still in full swing. So while researchers went on to build their illustrious academic careers and biotech industries reaped billions of dollars, Henrietta's family lived in poverty and ironically could not afford the health insurance that would give them access to the very medical breakthroughs that Henrietta cells have enabled. It was, and it was only when the best-selling book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklut in 2020 and a movie by Oprah Winfrey in 2017 that the world has been made aware of Henrietta Lacks, sorry. So Henrietta Lacks case has triggered major ethical reform in human subject research. In particular, in terms of informed consent, autonomy, and respect for selfhood. Today, the ownership, use, and sharing of human biospecimens in research is still a murky issue. So tissue samples taken for testing or removal have been called tissue scraps. Patients assumes, assumes that the hospital and clinics discard these scraps, but some don't. They are essential raw materials for medical researchers. Scientists use these samples to develop many of the modern drugs and treatment. Without these tissues, we would, not, we would have no tests for diseases like HIV and hepatitis, no vaccines for measles, polio, or no treatment for some cancers. Without these tissues, the pharmaceutical and biotech companies that rely on these biological materials would be out of billions of dollars. In the digital world, the equivalent of tissue scraps are called digital traces or digital breadcrumbs that people like us inadvertently share when we use the services of digital platforms. Like the scientists in, Hen in Henrietta Lack's story, these platforms feel that since they are giving free service, their users' data are fair game for them to collect, analyze, and eventually monetize. These platforms then feel the need to inform their users that their data are being collected, shared, and sold. Academic researchers have seized on the opportunity of the prevalence of this platform data and have built successful careers analyzing this data. But users like Henrietta Lacks, like us, are not aware of these uses and have not given informed consent. Yes, they may have clicked on the terms of service when they initially signed on, but who really reads these fine prints? Who really knows the, the implications of signing on? That is a requirement for an informed consent. So the problem with, then with medical research and now with digital research boils down to abstraction. The tissue samples and the di digital breadcrumbs are abstracted away as data points and then analyzed. The abstracted data points are decoupled from the associated humans and therefore not accorded the same respect and rights as reserved for live human beings. Here are two quotes, one referring to the human experiments by Nazi doctors 
and one about black box society in this digital world, all referring to the issue of abstraction. So there's ongoing issue of trust in the digital platforms. In response, code of ethics for various domains and professions are being revised to adapt to the challenges of the digital age. However, code of ethics, while useful, are guidelines and not law. And law has consistently lagged behind and is trying to catch up. The tech industry and academia have been wary of regulations and argue that more regulations will, sti will stifle innovation. However, with the mounting evidence of gross ethical violations and breach of trust, regulations have started to tighten, as we all know. GDPR started in May 2018, with similar laws being enacted in California, Japan, and other jurisdictions. In Australia, there has been a recent update of the Australian privacy law, and, in, and Queensland has just declared privacy is a human right starting January 2020. It is also time to rethink the prevailing business models. If data is an economic asset, shouldn't the producers benefit from the production of these assets? Why should the benefits accrue only to those enterprises that harvest, analyze, and monetize those assets? Are we, as citizens of this digital community, going to just accept surveillance capitalism as a default? Concurrently, we also need to rethink the economic model. The existing shareholder capitalism, where the firms are only responsible for their shareholders, should change to the stakeholder capitalism as, recommend, as recommended by the World Economic Forum, where private and public enterprises are responsible not just to their shareholders, but to all their stakeholders. While the solutions to these problems would require cooperation at the global scale, we as participants and actors in this digital world can all try to do what we can in our own small sphere of influence. And hopefully our grassroots efforts will catalyze the change that we want to happen. So this is the environment that our team at the Digital Observatory had to deal with when we started in 2018. So in the next few slides, I would like to describe how we dealt with these challenges and the Digital Observatory journey. Okay, so the Digital Observatory's mission is to enable the understanding of the dynamic digital landscape by providing researchers access to reliable and scalable research data infrastructure. Our current focus is social media data. Shortly after our project started in January 2018, Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal happened in March 2018. The scandal brought to the public consciousness the ethical and political implications of data harvesting, user profiling, and political manipulation using social media. Great timing, isn't it? So our, our team designed and built the digital observatory. We had to deal not only with the technical challenges, but also cultural as well as political. So our team aimed to build a trustable and ethical research infrastructure. One of the first steps we had to do is to stop and ask the difficult questions. Whose trust do we need to earn? What does trust practically mean in this context? And what are the key risks for the different stakeholders? So the key stakeholders we identified whose trust we need to earn are the data authors and the general public, the researchers and the research community, and the data platforms themselves. So what is trust in our context? It is about confidence that we will manage the associated risk appropriately and that benefits outweigh the risk. And there are different risks for different stakeholders. For example, for data authors and the general public, it will be about privacy and human rights. 
for researchers and research community, it will be, date, it will be about data quality, service reliability and sustainability, robust methodology, and human research ethics. For the data platforms, it will be about risk to their business <coughs> and risk to their technology and data governance. So in our research context, we have taken an infrastructure approach to address the problems and trust issues. And there are benefits of the and there are benefits for this data, for this infrastructure approach, such as holistic integration of technology, process, and people aspects of the infrastructure. So instead of multiple researchers building their own quick and dirty prototypes using whatever technology they can get their hands on, having an infrastructure developed and built by professional software engineers to a, a robust industry standard provide integration of technology and process at scale. The development of an infrastructure that is reliable, sustainable, reusable, and extensible with a long-term view and can service multitude of researchers and research needs. A side benefit of the infrastructure approach is its role for connecting researchers and other stakeholders from various fields and domains bursting the naturally forming silos in university research. Information security as well can be addressed from a systems view and at the infrastructure level instead of at the individual project level. So in building the infrastructure, the team identified key principles and made deliberate strategic choices in designing and implementing the infrastructure. Some of the principles are privacy and security are by design and not afterthoughts. Respect for data owners and authors is paramount. Long-term view versus short-term view. Data provenance, methodological transparency, and processes that enable users of data to access and use data responsibly. So what is a trustable and ethical data infrastructure? That would differ in different contexts. In our context, it's a data infrastructure that addresses the following requirements for trust. So respect for data authors, their privacy, their rights, and their expectations for usage of their data. Data ethics, quality, and reliability for the data users. Security and transparency for the data infrastructure. Respect for the data platform's terms of use. And governance, including data and process governance that codifies and implements these elements and underpins the data infrastructure. There are various factors that we need to take into consideration in the development of the data infrastructure and they are grouped under process, technology, and people. So in terms of processes, we needed to look at governance, the broader governance structures and resources, data bank ethics, standard operating procedures, and protocols. We need to do user research to identify the requirements and expectations of the users. We had to do horizon scanning to identify current and future trends and issues. And of course, the reg regulatory environment, the relevant legislation, privacy law, data protection law, and ethical codes. And data source research, the expectations of owners and authors of data, data source feasibility, data governance, and terms of service. For the technology aspect, we needed to look at information security, data source affordances such as API access, available information, uh, documentation, robustness, reliability, maintainability, sustainability, and scalability, understanding the available resources and constraints, understanding the data, underlying concepts and data models, and understanding the data methods, what analysis can be done with the data that we have. And last but definitely not the least, the people component. 
we need to design proper induction process and put in place relevant training and education plans for data users as well as for our team. So to summarize, our team applied the key principles in building the, data, the digital observatory. We redesigned and built the legacy research prototype we inherited and we deliberately engaged professional software developers to work on it rather than tech-savvy researchers who can code. In parallel with the technical development, we have to grapple with establishing robust governance processes. We work with key stakeholders and the Office of Research Ethics and Integrity. We spend a lot of time designing the protocols, the standard operating procedures, and the data bank ethics application. So we now have ethics approval to operate as a data bank, which covers the data collection, data tidying, data storage, governance, and custodianship. The current setup separates the data bank ethics and research project ethics. All research projects supported by the Digital Observatory are governed via the a terms of engagement with define, which defines the project scope and responsibilities. Our current capabilities focus on providing reliable data infrastructure, appropriate data management, governance, and security, provided by professional data infrastructure engineers and data scientists. We work with researchers to determine their data requirements and provide them with a tidy data set ready for analysis. The aim is so that researchers can focus more on their analysis rather than on the collecting and the pre-processing of the data. So our data bank consists of curated and ad hoc collections. For example, we maintain the Australian Twitter sphere, which is an ongoing collection of tweets from roughly half a million Australian Twitter accounts. The average monthly collection is over around 20 million tweets. We also have the capability to set up ad hoc collections, such as the 2019 federal elections. In this ad hoc collection, we collected data from around 1,500 federal election candidates. The number of tweets collected were around 1.8 million. And we, it's a short collection starting from 26 April 2019, and it finished 26 May 2019. So our roadmap includes more to add more data sources and data science workflows, depending on the research demand. We are also considering non-social media data sources in the future, if we can find the right use case. So while building out the infrastructure, our team has been busy. Our team has been so while building out the infrastructure, our team has been simultaneously supporting many research projects from different fields as shown in this slide. This interaction has been valuable for the team's understanding of the user needs and pain points. Insights from these user interactions are looped back into our development strategy and implementation. So we hope that the foundations of trust has been laid and will be further developed as we engage with data users in the future. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge our team, Betsy Albert, Sam Hames, and Alice Miller for rising up to the challenge. That is our contact email and Twitter handle. Additional thanks to the IFE Research Infrastructure Director, Sach Jaya Singhi, and IFE Director, Professor Kerry Wilson, for the support and guidance. Thank you. <laughs>